What's going on guys, my name is Alden Hero and welcome to my review of episode 11 of 13 Reasons Why. There will only be two episodes after this. Maybe another one, maybe like a full series recap episode, I'm not too sure. But anyway, if you're listening to this on SoundCloud and you want a visual aid, check out YouTube. If you're listening on whatever platform, check out the subreddit. And that's pretty much it. Let's get into the episode. So this is tape six, side A, and we learned from the last episode that this is in fact Clay's tape. So we're going to find out how he killed Hannah Baker as Tony suggested, well, as Tony confirmed in the last episode. Um, this is a story that she was saving for later, and we're going to find out what happened in that bedroom. There's a moody and dark intro to this episode with like dark flashbacks and really vague dialogue. So we see Clay in the park with Tony saying, I can't be here, I can't listen here, I, I need you to drive anywhere. Uh, Hannah chimes in in Clay's earphones and says, what else could have happened that night? We flash back to the day of the party before the party had even taken place. Clay wishes Hannah good luck with her fresh start. Hannah points out the role reversal between the two, with Clay being the party goer and Hannah being the introvert. This is another way that Hannah is just adept at learning people. Like, she's a good people reader. Well, is she even? I don't know, but she seems to get Clay right every single time she calls. Um, she calls him, basically. Every time she makes an assumption about Clay, it's usually correct. Uh, maybe that could be something that suggests that her and Clay were meant to be together, um, because she was actually quite tone deaf when it came to interpreting other people and their characters. Um, either way, Clay leaves for the party amidst the goodbyes of a caring mother, which is something of a shift from the mother of episode one, who seemed cold and uncaring. Here, Lainey is overbearing, if anything, telling Clay to call if he needs a ride home and not to do any hardcore drugs, or any drugs at all. Was she always like this? We see Hannah's arrival from Clay's perspective in the party, and it's so different from her own. When she walks into the room, she's basically glowing. Everything around her is secondary to her. There's a crowd chanting her name, and time has basically slowed down. It's like if Kendrick Lamar just turned up at your school and tried to walk down the corridor. Whereas from Hannah's perspective, as we saw, I think, two episodes ago, she turns up and tries to find room to just walk amidst all the chaos of the party. Um, I did comment on how people were chanting her name. It seemed kind of weird, if anything. She seemed confused by it. Uh, there's a visible discomfort in her step. But from Clay's perspective, it's like... It, it's like Beyonce is walking down the red carpet. This is really well directed and the different windows into each person's mind is a really neat way of framing their selected worldviews. Clay would never know that Hannah is in a bad place mentally from observing her here. And that's a really hard technique to put onto a screen, especially in a TV show, but they do a really good job of it and they continue to do that throughout the episode and um, I'll try and mention why if I remember when it pops up. Jeff convinces Clay to just go and talk to Hannah. Clay, when not talking to Hannah, is an awkward, stumbling mess of a man, but Clay talking to Hannah emanates charm and confidence. This scene jumps forward in time to Clay expressing complete shock at Hannah's interpretation of him. Uh, Clay being confident and making things easy, Tony says she's telling her truth, and this is typical Tony vague statement that doesn't properly express what's going on, but he's right. Everything in the past is through Hannah's lens, and everything in the present is through Clay's, and sometimes they don't really overlap at all, and that's pretty interesting. Like, it's just a really cool way of showing two people in two completely different places in their heads and in their lives. Tony foreshadows a huge revelation for Clay when he says, I don't know what your truth is, and I don't know what's going to happen when you find out hers. It's pretty clear that Clay is going to visit himself maybe dropping the ball or perceiving himself as dropping the ball, but he's going to do something that's going to lead to a lot of uh, conflict and self-blaming, I would imagine, because that is the clay way of handling um, trauma and conflict in his life. In real time, we get some dialogue about the pending case between the Bakers and the school. and We learn that the Bakers are proceeding with the case and that the kids are probably going to be interviewed about the atmosphere of the school. I suppose they're going to be deposed um, because it's the, the Baker's legal team is probably going to film them and see what it would be like if they were to testify, if it were to go to open court, if they have that much of a case um, against them, which obviously they believe they do because they're going ahead. Um, 
This is followed by a really rare scene from the present day involving Justin and his home life. Uh, he's in his like apartment, or his mother's apartment, I guess, and he has an argument with that meathead neo-Nazi guy. I think his name is Seth, I can't remember, but he's dating Justin's mother and... Justin says, either he goes or I go, and Justin's mother says to the Nazi, I'll get you another beer. If you can hear a hedge strimmer outside, I'm so sorry. I'm a professional podcaster, and sometimes I like to perform while people are strimming their hedges. Anyway, Justin decides to leave the house, and he calls Jessica and leaves her a voicemail. He packs up his bag and starts moving as the scene cuts away to Jessica, who's still flirting with Bryce while he's in her house, setting up the prospect of an angry, riled-up Justin walking in on something, maybe? Um, But then (sighs) Jessica suggests they go to Bryce's hot tub. We see Clay and Hannah getting on really well together at the party. And it's really nice to see. Clay is actually killing it in terms of his social conduct. He's just... He's he's being exactly the type of person that she needs him to be. And, like, she's responding in kind. Everything is going really well. Eventually, they go upstairs in the house and find an empty room to go and talk in. Clay is really hesitant to listen on. And then the scene switches over to Zach. We get our first glimpse at Zach's house, his, his privileged family life, and it's a stark contrast to Justin's dingy apartment. They're talking at the table about, uh, basically, Zach is Asian, and on TV, all Asian parents are disappointed in their children, uh, even if they are like the highest, most gifted and highest achieving kids in the school. And Zach's mother is like, you should be the captain. You have the most blah, blah, blah. And Zach is like, ah, I don't really care about that. Uh, I don't want to be captain. And Justin's in a rough place right now. Then Zach receives a bunch of messages from Justin asking for his help because he has nowhere to stay. But Zach just puts the phone down. And then we get a glimpse of Alex's family life and learn that he has got an older brother named Peter, who he appears to be in the shadow of. His older brother is telling his father a story about how manly he is. Then the doorbell rings and it's Justin. He asks if he can stay and it's quite a bold move from Justin. Like I think this scene is supposed to show some form of emotional maturity from Justin because he gets asked why he won't go to Bryce's and he replies with, you know why. I also think that this like, this story uh, beginning in the struggle of Justin's home and showcasing what a miserable experience that is for him is like a useful source of sympathy in any attempt to rebuild his character, uh, which I suppose they are trying to do. I, I kind of thought, I, I don't know what episode I said it on, it was the first time that we do get a glimpse into Justin's home life when Jessica went to his house and saw um, the neo-Nazi guy there. And I said at the time that I thought that was setting up a redemption arc for Justin. Um, and they seem to be going ahead with that now, I suppose, with the flashback to um his his family life again and also just the fact that he's being a big man by going to Alex here even if it is out of necessity um the fact that he's acknowledging to Alex that Bryce did something uh it just seems like he's a little bit more willing to live out in the open the communications teacher uh comes into Mr Porter's office and tells him about the note that was found in her class that Clay told her was from Hannah Mr Porter like <laughs> So Mr. Porter should be noticeably tense here, but obviously he's a mannequin that's incapable of displaying any semblance of humanity whatsoever. So as a result, we get this really flat scene that goes nowhere to adding to the stakes in the school's case. Like, it's not even clear what Mr. Porter thinks. His his character just seems to have absolutely no focus whatsoever. Like, he is truly terrible. Justin gets a call from Jessica and learns that she's hanging out with Bryce, which he's super concerned about for obvious reasons. He and Alex decide to go over to Bryce. Clay and Tony go to Monet's, and I wouldn't even bother talking about this scene, but Clay is a wreck here, um, and he won't even eat. Tony tells him he needs to get in the right headspace. Uh, he needs to eat some food. It's the only way that he's going to just feel better. Um, but Sky picks up on uh, Clay's like turmoil and says, there's some truth you don't want to face. And this is the most cringeworthy thing in the entire show so far. I've watched almost every season of Suits, which is a show where every main character has a superpower. It's not actually called a superpower, but the main guy in the show has a 100% 
photographic memory, which is obviously an absolutely ludicrous suggestion. Like, A, it's not how a photographic memory works. B, it's impossible to retain that much information. But somehow, in the context of the show, it just works because that's how they've built it. There's a character in Suits called Donna Paulson who can read everybody's mind, and that's her superpower. Um, it's not labeled that way. It's labeled as her being really good at reading people. Um, but some of her scenes are really cringeworthy because she just looks at people's faces and continues guessing her way into their head before she lands on the truth. Um, I say it's cringeworthy, but it's believable within that universe because of the way that they've set it up. In this scene here, in 13 Reasons Why, they don't even bother with that kind of approach. It's just straight up the weird goth girl who's distant and rebellious, but also woke and righteous says, there's some truth you can't face. And it's so, so bad really really bad then she says she can do a tarot reading which clay accepts this is also pretty bad uh sky starts reading out his cards and it leads to this personal argument about how they used to be friends but they went their separate ways they both seem to blame each other for that sky ends up criticizing hannah after clay implies that she's jealous of hannah and sky says that hannah was weak for killing herself despite having scars on her wrists I don't even know what to make of this revelation. Like, I don't think for one second that this is the fitting response of Sky's character to have this sort of ridiculous opinion. And it pigeonholes her character into just being the girl who's really bitter about Clay's connection to Hannah, even though Hannah is dead. And I don't know why, I just find it really, really messy. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's it's just not believable. Um in in every context that we have experienced Sky's character, the idea that she would deem suicide to be a cowardly act just does not fit in there. Um, if if you think everything about her, she's she doesn't care. Um, she has like really strong opinions about the popular kids. She clearly has a sort of a dark like undertones about her, um, which makes sense like with the wrist scarring and stuff. Um, but the fact that she deems suicide to be cowardly is nuts. But even Clay's reaction to this, he pointed to those scars as if he knew that that was a thing. And Clay, obviously, at this point in his life, is a guy who's going to be concerned if someone he knows is suicidal. And, you know, scars on your wrist usually depict suicidal urges. I, I just think this whole thing is just really, really odd. Um, we're supposed to not sympathize with Sky. I suppose, because she takes the flatline response that Hannah was an idiot or that Hannah was weak or whatever it is. But we should actually be sympathizing with Sky more so than any living character in the show right now if we don't want a repeat of what happened. The only thing that would separate Sky from Hannah would be that Sky hasn't gone and made 57,000 cassette tapes explaining why she did what she did. But <laughs> I actually think in a really weird way that would make sense of Sky's character. So... I just don't know. Um, I, I just did not feel like that scene uh, worked very well at all. Anyway, Clay listens on and he and Hannah enter Jessica's bedroom and make fun of her rock collection before getting down to business. Okay, that's a really bad way to describe a scene that people will have been waiting for since episode one. But Clay and Hannah finally kiss and it is magical. Uh, probably, I, don't, I had no emotional response to it. But anyway, <laughs> Hannah says that uh, she could imagine a future where she's happy and how good life could be. Um, she then goes into some kind of panic attack and completely freaks out at Clay. And she tells him to get out and he's like, but, but I, and she's like, I said, get the fuck out. This is such a left turn. Hannah says in the cassette that Clay does not belong on this list because he's not like every other guy. He's kind and decent and she doesn't deserve him. She says she would have ruined him and that it wasn't him. It was her. Then Clay in Tony's car has a moral crisis, gets out of the car, he stands on the edge of a cliff that they're on uh, with the view of the city beneath them. He imagines a world where he stays in the room and confronts Hannah, pushing back on her panic, which culminates in Hannah asking why he didn't say that to her when he was alive. Tony walks Clay back from the edge and Clay completely falls apart. Then Justin and Alex arrive at Bryce's house to play poker, I guess. Uh, Jessica sits on Bryce's lap and it all gets a bit weird. Jessica, or sorry, Justin gets up and drags Jessica out of the room. They start yelling at each other and the other jocks come out like to try and stop it. Justin asks why the fuck she's hanging out with Bryce. And she asks, why is that a problem? And Justin says, because 
he fucking raped you. And he says it in front of everybody else. Jessica then tells Justin she hates him and walks away. Bryce follows on, and bizarrely, nobody says anything else before the scene cuts away to Olivia. But I really want to know what happened after. Like, did they all just go back to playing poker? Did they sit around and talk strategy? Like, what did they do after this scene happened? Because the cat's out of the bag now in the sense that Justin, who is one of the leading members of this jock crew, he has taken the stance that Bryce raped Jessica. And before that, the party line in the jock crew was that that didn't happen. Um, like, the, yeah, the, the cat is out of the bag and Bryce just walks away and we don't see any fallout from it. We do get a scene later where Jessica's crying in bed. Bryce texts her and says, are you OK? And uh, Jessica just cries even harder. And that's it. We don't get any other fallout from this. So we're going to have to wait till the next episode, I guess. But I really need to see what happens with the jock crew. Like, I need to see... If they end up uh, like dividing, forming teams, Team Bryce, Team Justin, uh, Justin and Bryce, are they gonna like go up against each other? It's 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 an interesting prospect, but it's one that I need a more immediate <laughs> response to. Uh, Olivia, as I mentioned earlier, she goes through some of Hannah's things and finds what looks to be a blueprint for the cassette project. Just reading between the lines there, because there's a bunch of names listed on it, and it's sort of like in a map form or like a, a a mind map or one of those things um but it looks like mr porter has a tape and i'm surprised to learn that but it makes perfect sense because there was a scene earlier in which he expressed fear that he was going to lose his job and i personally think that he's terrible at his job and i would love to hear a tape of of uh, Hannah just calling him out on his bullshit. So I hope that that's what we get in the next episode, and then that episode 13 is just the fallout altogether, maybe with a little bit of Hannah. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm still uh, watching this at the same pace as I'm reviewing it, so uh, hopefully you guys will get to find out. Um, maybe by Thursday, or, or actually Wednesday would probably be a good day, but... Um, I'll see you when I'm available. Anyway, uh, I really enjoyed this episode as well. Um, it took us another step closer to the finale, which I'm kind of getting hyped for. Um, I liked the shift in Justin's character. I liked the fact that he went to Bryce, that he's all angry, which he, he generally is, but at least this time his anger is righteous and it seems to be pointed in the right direction and that's just something that we need from the show. Um, I, that The scene with Sky in, in Monet's just really threw me off. Like, I, I just... I. I did not really agree with that whole thing at all. I liked Tony's perspective throughout the episode. He was kind of trying to be everybody's friend. Um, Clay also called Tony out on his bullshit at one point and says, stop saying things all the time to try and be all wise and like Yoda. And it's very true. That is what he does. Um, but yeah, I, I, don't, I, I wouldn't rate this episode as highly as the two that came before it. But it's definitely like a really good step towards uh, the finale that I'm hoping for. So... We'll see what happens there. Uh, I'll be back again with episode 12 soon. I've been El De Niro. Thanks for listening.